Okay, welcome um, to the last of this series of conversation that Sylvia has been doing for the last three months at the school. Uh, today the guest is Pipo Chorra, the director of the Maxi Museum in Rome. I uh, will let uh, Sylvia to do the proper introduction. Uh, I just want to make a quick announcement. One is if you haven't seen the show that is curated by Sylvia, uh, the Max Center at the Schindler House. You should go and see it. It's absolutely extraordinary. And also, graciously, Sil Sylvia has agreed to do a private tour for the first 20 students that will sign with uh, Elena with the TCTA. So first come, first serve. Uh, if you sign on that list, then we would arrange with Sylvia a day and a time for those 20 students to have almost like a, like a master class in the site. Um, on that note, I'll, I'll leave the, the floor to Sylvia. Thanks, um, Hernan. Um, although I, I don't actually think this is the last. I think I'm at some point having a conversation with Eric. Yeah, that doesn't count for that us. That doesn't count. <laughs> oh. For us, this is the last one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have thought that a conversation between me and Eric would be absolutely the most spectacular conflagration you could imagine. I'm sure, but it, it's not with a guest. <laughs> Host and guests at the same time, it's cool. You're right, there's one more. Yes, well, Eric and I like to argue about just about everything, so that should be fun. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, on the way to introducing people, I mean, rather than just introduce people himself, I, I wanted to, I hate speaking into these things, I just, Nasty. Um, uh, I wanted to say a little bit about why I thought uh, it would be interesting to have people here. And um, I was making up a kind of fake history, which went something like this. Um, up until more or less the period of Beaubourg, architects were interested in museums as buildings. In other words, they looked to the museum as a potential commission. <laughs> Um, for the construction of a building. And after, more or less, the period of Beaubourg, the museum changed its ontology for architecture and became a site instead of a building, and it became a place for the uh, articulation of architectural ideas. So around 1970, the relationship between architecture and the museum changed fundamentally, and I would say that that relationship is undergoing a similar seismic transformation right now. And um, transformations always come with a certain kind of growing pain. And many of the uh, gossip, chit chat, uh, misplaced emails, um, uh, complex reviews in newspapers, et cetera, that have been generated over the last couple of weeks here in LA over the Pacific Standard Time shows are exactly um, uh, an, uh, evidence of this transformation. Um, I, I mean to say that in the press, all of this stuff about lawsuits and who's in what spot in the museum and is there enough money for this and all that kind of stuff, it, it has reduced the problem to a kind of parochial politics, very apparently very local to the situation here. And what I'm trying to say is much more interesting than that, all of that chitter chatter is really about a fundamental change in the relationship of architecture to the cultural landscape of which the museum is, let's say, the first stop. And it becomes a more interesting problem when you look at it that way, and I hope that we will end up by being able to just talk about that. But it's because of this change that I thought it was very important for one of these conversations to deal with the question of the museum today. And that's why Pipo is here. He's a senior curator of architecture at Rome's uh, Maxi Museum. Um, and that's, the, uh, that's his, he, he wears many hats. 
He's a professor of design and theory at the School of Architecture at uh, Scoli Piceno. He's a member of many uh, editorial boards around Italy, Casabella, Gomorra, and, and others. He's written uh, several books, one on Peter Eisenman, some of you might know, Young Italian Architects, etc. And he has designed and curated um, many, many different uh, exhibitions around Italy and elsewhere. He sits on juries of uh, commissions uh, all over the world. Um, he's a guy, uh, he belongs to um, a, uh, I don't know whether this is fair, I was about to say there's a kind of behind the scenes orchestrator of the field, um, sometimes in front of the curtain, sometimes behind the curtain, uh, like the wizard in The Wizard of Oz. Um, there is this person back there who is orchestrating a lot of what then looks, what ultimately comes to look like an, an inevitable landscape of architecture. And Pipo is a, is a really significant player in, in, that, in that field, although you might not recognize his name and his face the way you would recognize Zaha's, let's say. Well. <clears throat> On the other hand, maybe more recently, and the final reason that he's here, he's a member of the Young Architects Program jury. Maybe you'll tell us something about that. So this is the jury that decides who's going to do the PS1 competition pavilion in New York, and who's going to do it in Chile, and who's going to do it in Istanbul, et cetera, et cetera. So um, for many of you, uh, I'm sure in the back of your minds, your fantasy is your first job your first job, um, not your first project, but your first <laughs> job will be one of these pavilions. Um, this is the guy you have to, uh, th this is the door you have to go through. So I'm introducing you to that door and it's up to you and us in this conversation to figure out what key you need to uh, unlock it. Um, so, uh, Welcome. Yes. <laughs> um, and so I asked him sort of as per usual now to show us a little bit about what he's doing and then we'll have a conversation, okay. um, keep it informal all together. Thank you. Uh, first of all, you will forgive my primitive English. And of course, Sylvia is right because I, uh, it was a slow mutation, I would say, from the 80s to the end of the 90s, where I basically stopped considering myself somebody who was trying to build a museum versus somebody who operates in a museum. I actually lost the competition that Zaha won for the Maxi. We were a group of, at that time, young Italian architects. I have some other museums with competition won around Italy that were never built. But then at a certain point, I found that especially in the Italian landscape, which somebody here knows as well as I do, uh, it was easier to address architecture uh, issues uh, through working in a museum, through being a curator, rather than trying to build that it was so hard to build in Italy. So that was a very appropriate, I would say, introduction. I will tell you like 13 things, I read 13 sentences, I will be very quick and then I will be happy to, to talk with, with, with Silvia, which is such a, an enlightening uh, interlocutor. Uh, I, I, wanted to, to, I wanted to entitle these things against curating, because I'm really made nervous by all this curating disease that is around the world. But then I was more moderate, and I called it public arc. No? So a museum is, Generally speaking, a museum of architecture is an institution which is made to preserve, promote, collect uh, items of architectural culture no? uh, in relation to specific space and time. The early architecture museums were mostly tied to the promotion of local cultures in Moscow versus Stockholm or versus Oslo. Uh, or a master, this is a, you, you know how the Fondation Le Corbusier is completely dedicated to uh, the heritage and legacy of Le Corbusier or the CCA when it started with Ms. Van der Rohe. Uh, so this is the original status of architecture museum. But this is 
but it's also an uncanny institution because uh, it is definitely a gallery space where we generally do don't, we don't have the possibility to show the work, but we always have to deal uh, with the representation of the work. The museum reacts to this, I mean, like, uh, ancient discussion about the work and the representation, l'opera and the representation of the opera. Uh, the museum react to this, the curator react to this by individuating a space between the work and the viewer. In this space is where we display a number of devices committed to represent and communicate the work to make it accessible. So there is a conceptual space. I, I put this Luigi Ghiri. Luigi Ghiri is an incredibly interesting Italian photographer who worked between the 70s and the early 90s, who was taken to architecture by photographing Aldo Rossi's work. And Giri runs all over the space of photography. And one of the topics he, he investigates is the relationship between the viewer and the object, something that then Thomas Struth maybe made more monumental. But this space, the space between the viewer and the, and the work, is, a, is also a space of ambiguity, since the representation tends to become a work of art in itself, most of the times in architecture, surrounded by flows of aura and deserving mu mu musealization and installation itself. If we think of the drawings Aldo Rossi made for the Teatro del Mondo, what are they? They are uh, functional to the work, or they are work themselves, uh, they become a work, but at the same time they... Uh, so we, we live in this ambiguity, and we have to exploit this ambiguity to make the Architecture Museum, what Sylvia was depicting before, an, an operating uh, subject in the discussion. Uh, sometimes that people get lost in this ambiguity and, and, and try impossible, no? Uh, adventures like bringing the Teatro del Mondo, a replica of the Teatro del Mondo on the ground, which is, was probably the saddest uh, event I've ever seen in the architecture world. The space, the space between the viewer and the object, together with the role uh, and the architecture of contemporary museum, also fuels some sort of mutation towards a condition in which the difference between the object and the representation of the object tends to disappear. So the premises to allow the architects to do what Silvio was uh, calling them to do, so to practice innovation actually in the museum, to practice architectural experiments, to practice a space, a new space relationship in the museum is this uh, thinning and thinning uh, tightening difference between the work and the representation of the work. The work of Francois Roche, of course, is one of the clearest. This is a piece we have in our collection. Uh, this space, which we now understand it's a physical space, but also a conceptual space at the same time, is extremely flexible in terms of dimension, time, uh, sight, and it's what most allows the museum to become an active agent in the cultural, actual production of contemporary architecture. This is a piece of, of the show we have on now, which is a dedicated to the relationship between oil, post-oil uh, fuel and architecture. And these architects actually install the situation in which the viewer bikes and produce energy, which is then differently uh, you can charge your telephone or do things like this, or work with the algae, as always now. Uh, uh, actually, um, there, there could be, we could put three, three main ways no, in which the architecture, in, the, in which the museum becomes an actual operator of the architecture world, an actual maker of architecture. I think the, the first is probably the traditional idea of what a curator is, somebody that chooses and creates a sequence. Uh, this is very much in the history of museums. Philip Johnson did this at least twice, no? in a very successful way, in 1932 with Russell Hitchcock, in 1988 with uh, Wigley, to promote no? so one architecture versus other architectures. Uh, 
A second possibility, I mean, that's an homage to one of your professors, the Zelena installation that will be shown in Los Angeles the next days. The second, which is already more active, is to display the object, to build the object in the museum itself. You know? So we, we lose that idea that the museum is a place where we put the drawings or the model of a building, but we do the building in the museum, so the object becomes the architect's production in the show. Or, and this is an homage to myself, when I used to be an architect, because it's a little thing I designed together with artists in a place near Bologna, Pianoro, uh, is when the, when the museum and the architect together go outside the, the limit of the museum and build actual public space in the city. So the museum becomes the operator of the public space of the city. So interacts both with the architectural ideas and with the space where life is displayed, no? where that life takes place. Um, since Sylvia just did a wonderful exhibition on these topics and probably widely lecturing in Los Angeles on the subject, I will only add some little things about this, uh, especially telling you about some specific work I did in the Maxi, and only in, in places that are less institutional uh, than the Maxi. This is a work we did with students from a school and students from the Ohio State University we used to come for workshops in my school. We actually built uh, a public space, built an exhibition space within the space of a shopping mall. No? And it was very funny because in the beginning, it was like 13 years ago, and we were rich at that time. We could afford to build things like this in a, in a space like that. It was interesting because when, when this was institutional, I asked this guy of the shopping mall to allow us to build this. Everything was very fine. But then when the guy, when the, when the students built the thing, it was physical fight with the people. You no, know, when you, have, you you take away a shop window from somebody or some tables from from a bar, then there was conflict, physical conflict, which was an interesting way of understanding the difference between shopping space and public space. No, Not, notwithstanding RAM. So there are there are opportunities, there are conditions in which the curator and the museum becomes agents in the city, in the public space, and in the architecture world at the same time. The Maxi is, is a very the Maxi is a lucky uh, is a lucky stage for these experiments, especially because of, uh, of mistakes. No? History is always made of mistakes. So the mistake in this case is that the last the one, two of the last wings designed by Zaha were not built because of the, because of, of the economic crisis, because we didn't know what to put in it, because, because of Italy. But then the, the, the fact that the, the construction is incomplete gave much more importance and much more power to the public space of the Max. This is a, an image by Iwan Ban, of course. And the museum took a lot of advantage, enormous advantage, by having its courtyard uh, transform into a real public space. Because you have a, a public street here and a public street in the back, and people cross just simply to go to one place, from one place to another. And people come on Sunday, and, and kids come in the, muse in the space. Of, so it became a real, let's say, piazza, but it became a real public space that the neighbor and the city use very freely, and which is also, I think, a very important detail in the relationship, in the complicated relationship that generally a city like Rome has with contemporary architecture when it comes to the center. And the way the museum was accepted easily uh, with, with very, very little conflictual, controversial conditions in, in Rome, I think is partly tied to the success that it had in this public space. So. Because of this openness, because of this condition of Piazza, Max is a very good experimental stage, I think, to test what architecture can do uh, when it comes to the outdoor. Sorry. I, I never read. Huh? Uh, we always, since I became the curator of the Maxi, I. I always thought I want to build in the museum. This is exactly probably what Sylvia was mentioning. I thought of this space for a space where I want to build 
things with the architects. I want to challenge the architects to, to fight Zaha's space. I want the architects to engage this public space. So since the first exhibition, which was an exhibition that had art and architecture together, where I was inserting 10 works of architects in a, in a, in a sequence of eight, 85 work of art, my, my, my idea, my proposals to the architect was to build something. So we actually started by building uh, architecture in the space of the museum. So using the museum as something which is uh, in between, no? a space which is in between uh, cultural representation of uh, ideas and life, you know, everyday life. This is a project by Santiago Cirujeda, a Spanish architect and an activist, I would say. Uh, so this attitude to, to building architecture uh, was for me the expression of three main tasks, I think. One is to create an immediate relationship between the indoor space and the outdoor space of the museum. The one very good thing in Zaha's building is there is no actual monumental entrance. No? You get sucked into the space of the museum in a very flowing way, in a very easy way. So I, wa I wanted to emphasize this, that I want to work exactly in the same way, indoor and outdoor, inside the limit of the museum. This is a Teddy Cruz installation for that show. And outside, it is a house built by Samir Intala. It's a three-story house built in, in 12 days in the garden of the museum. So the first task is to demolish this idea of a museum as a precinct, no? as a limit. The second is to maximize the, pop uh, the possibility for the museum, or for the curatorial project, as we would say today, to actually shape the city, operating experiments in its alive body. Of course, there are we are not the first ones to do that. We started to the YAP project, but of course, the experience of the Serpentine in London, even though it's very different, it's a very nice park. It's a, like a beautiful object in the park, but still the idea that the museum produces every year a new architecture that shapes the space was for us a very interesting um, predecessor. And also thank, uh, something which is for me very, very important in, in, a, in an architecture scenario, like the Italian one, which is otherwise very lazy, I would say, very, very still, very hard to move on. And then the third task was uh, to participate to the discussion about architecture through architecture. So we wanted the architects to be part of a larger debate on what architecture is and could be and will be now and in the future, but not by whatever, not only through exhibitions or through statements or through things we write, but also directly through architecture, which become physical experimentation of their idea. In, uh, in the first uh, Rome YAP competition, there was a beautiful project by this guy, which is named Azif Khan, he's a designer from London, and his project was to build a cloud uh, in the garden of the museum. Uh, it was made by helium and, and, and soap, basically. Of course, I, I never believed it would work for the whole summer, and in fact, uh, we chose another project, but it was very interesting to challenge him, and then finally the guy was able to build it, in a, of course, in a limited space, in a gallery, for a very limited time, but I mean, it was very, very experimental, and it was very important that the museum was the fuel for, for, for such uh, experiments. Um, of course, this idea of uh, transforming, it's interesting also to see the difference, no? because in the, the PS1 condition is a wallet condition. You have really a yard which is in a wall, this is a Philip Johnson, a very young architect, a proposal for the DJ set uh, at the PS1, is one, one of the first edition, 1999, I think. Uh, so in the, in the, it, you have to pay to get into the garden of the PS1, so you go to a party, you pay for the party, you, you, la you live in the space created for these summer events, and it's a very interesting experience on this side. On the, on the other side, for, at the Maxi, this was last year, Wendy's, 
when d. Uh, the max is different. The max is open. You can get into the, the space for the whole time. You can basically spend your time. So it's, it, it works differently. It works, uh, of course, when there is a big event, as it happens often in the summer. But it works uh, also for everyday life, no? So people coming and babysitters bringing their kids every day, every morning to the museum and spending their time there, if there is, especially if there is some water in the installation. Uh, this, was the, this was the project we chose for the first year of the Maxi YAP project. We were very happy with it. Um, only one second. And it's interesting because they were... They were very young. Uh, very sorry, oh dear. I lost it. What is it? Now I put it in the bar. Yeah. Is it Yeah. No, no, I know, I know, I know. I was found here. Uh, it was interesting because we chose very, very young, completely unknown architects, and, and it was nice to let, let them have this uh, interesting experience. It's very interesting because when you get into the maxi, into the selection of the five finalists, then you get exhibited now in the four museums all around the world to do the, the YAP project, which is Santiago del Chile, the MoMA, uh, Istanbul Modern in Istanbul and Rome. But it was also interesting to, yeah, these are the architects, so they were physical, they are physically involved in the construction. I think this is a very good thing also, especially for Italian architects, who are not very used to the, to the moment of the construction. So it's also, I think it's very interesting for us to, um, to see the differences between the, the, the various physical conditions, the spatial condition that allows you different kind of investigation. It's also it's one nice thing because the idea is to use this program to promote, no, to promote young firms. Uh, this worked very well for this this group, which now has an open a solo show in Paris. And the beautiful thing is that the these red flowers, these red poppies that were designed for the YAP, then became a design object you can you can buy. And the company who Manufacturers, it's Via Bizzuno is selling a lot of these huge, very expensive uh, flowers. I'm nearly done. Uh, this is the, this is what we did the second year. It was also interesting to try to open up because in the second year in Rome, uh, the, the group we chose was a mixed group with two girls from New York and an architect from Rome. It was complicated on the organizational point of view, but it was also interesting to have. And the, this this bench was shaped by all the position you can take with yoga uh, in the garden of the museum. Uh, this raises the. For Silvia, because of course this raises a lot, this, this experience tend to raise many different, or to address different uh, questions. Of course, one is this closeness that we live now between architecture and art. No? The, this idea of installation has been, was learned by the architects, especially by what the artists have been trying to, and starting to do much earlier than the architects. And so these, also, these questions was, of course, what Sylvia was investigating in this book. Uh, but on the other side, this is a way where you can try to exploit architecture. Architecture becomes some physical things you can be, you build in the museum, you, you test in the reaction to, with people, you put your architecture in, in, in the middle of people's life. So that's where it happens. And, and, and becomes, uh, these are different. This was the YAP, uh, I think 2007 in New York, some other one in New York. Uh, it's very interesting now that this program opened up to new space, to new places. Santiago, this is a beautiful installation in Santiago with this kind of dripping 
uh, forest. This is the last year in Santiago. It's a cornfield with a maze going through it. And this is a particularly beautiful project we chose last year in uh, Istanbul. It's very interesting because the Istanbul modern is very close to the, to the, to the harbor. Generally, you have a big boat sitting in this area right in front of the museum. But then there is a fence, of course, so you cannot access the space close to the water. So these architects had a very nice idea, which was to, to, to dig holes in this bank so you, and, and to get down to the sea, and then to put sal galleggianti, no? to put something that, and, and then you have this series of shadow elements that will be moving all the time, because they will stand actually uh, in the sea. They will be touching the sea, and will be floating all the time and creating floating shadow in, in the thing. So, so what I think is important is that the museum uh, houses discussion about the architecture. The museum houses the architecture experiments. So the architect uh, has the possibility to build. And this is also interesting because it makes this, this eliminate differences because you can have Frank Gehry building your installation, but you can have you know somebody just coming out from the school that has the possibility to build his own project. This also allows architecture to test its limits because today the limits of architecture are completely uncertain. You're testing some limits here in the in, in Sciarc, you know, on, on the side of whatever, robotics or mathematics. Somewhere, somewhere else people is working on sociological issues or anthropological or so architecture or art. So architecture is, a, is an uncertain field that needs to be redefined every day. And this kind of practice we used to uh, try to do in the museum, I think, are a very good mean uh, to that. Of course, the architecture, the museums uh, challenges the urban, the public space, not only through installations. Now, we also do this through different ways. For instance, one of the ways, of the possibilities we have to challenge the public discussion, the public domain, is through the topics we investigate in installations, in, in exhibitions. Uh, I'll show you just two very quick uh, possibility that we did. Uh, the, the first one this exhibition Andrew Zago was in, which is called Recycle. The idea was to turn upside down this kind of green idea of recycling to understand what recycle could mean in terms of architectural theory and ideas. So we not only put together Duchamp with, with, uh, with some beautiful experiments from the Italian architecture of the 30s by Portaluppi or Mata Clark or the Eyeline or the Germans reusing elements of one building to do another building or Wang Shu's uh, bricks of demolished buildings or Nene Cherry's uh, songs with, with the beautiful Rybzinski videos uh, of, of overwriting, but we also, again, we, we use this recycling uh, issue to, um, to actually build in the museum something. So quickly and very shortly, we can see this. So we invited a, a group of German, a German group which is called Raum Labor Berlin, to work in the museum for one week, and we got money from this from the Ministry of Education. So we had to involve high school students. So they had 15 high schools, 19 high school students taken from all over Italy to work with them to build this house, which was built only with material taken from waste, from disposal areas. So it was quite a beautiful experience so we could, on one side, challenge the theory of uh, and the ideas that stand around this concept of recycling. But at the same time, we built a space in the outdoor of the museum, which was then used for whatever, other things, other things happening in the museum. It hides all the time. Scusate. Or the, the second chapter of this series of show, which is dedicated to energy, so to the idea 
of how, starting from the beautiful experiences that the Italian architects did in the 50s and 60s, designing gas stations or highway stations or restaurants on the highways, and how oil in that moment was optimistically in the great fuel, not only to move around your car, but also to shape architecture and to stimulate ideas in architecture. At the same time, we ask the architects to investigate what this could be today, what this could be today in a future, in a very close future where oil will not be the only way to move around our vehicles and, and, and oil power will not go, it's not going to be the only power you use, we use to this. So we, and I, uh, I think the first time I thought of this, to this show is when I saw um, Schwarzenegger presenting his hydrogen fueled um, vehicle, no? Thinking, so we think that everything can be sold by technology. And we, we do this exhibition because we do not think that everything can be sold by technology. If technology doesn't come with aesthetics, with idea and form, with uh, idea of space. So we wanted to uh, investigate topics which are very close to people's people everyday life in architectural terms. So we do have algae to produce hydrogen in, in the show, but we also ask the architects to investigate the possibility to understand what energy will mean in architectural terms in the future. This is only, the only one I show is this project by John Oero, an architect from South Africa who designed this kind of ar uh, artificial trees where you will be cultivating everything. Uh, emphasizing the importance of manpower. And it's nice that next year for the design, um, jo when Johannesburg will be the design capital, they will build this prototype after this show. So uh, this is Fujimoto also installation in the, in the, in the, in the thing. So there are uh, different ways in which a museum can produce uh, uh, thinkings, ideas on public space, ideas on architecture is through uh, exhibitions uh, is through the actual building of physical objects that become experimental space for architecture. And then also I think the choice we do in terms of what the, our exhibition address, the, uh, the, the, uh, the possibility of addressing issues and topics that are somehow interchange, no? spaces of interchange between the architecture and the world are also very, very useful to to, to fuel architecture, to give architecture the possibility to, re, to, to, to be new every day, to expand. We are all, all of us are trying to understand how to expand the presence and the field, the possibility of architecture in contemporary world. And this is our, a few experiences we're doing to trying to do that. Grazie. Leave, leave those up so that then we can chat. Um, uh, uh, so many, so many interesting things to think about. I, I guess my uh, my my immediate reaction to seeing all of this is um, something like, uh, "Wow, the space of the museum is way more interesting than the space of architecture." Like, I would way rather live in the museum in this gallery space than in what you, like an quote, actual building. So um, you, 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 you started by talking about the work as opposed to its representation and described a kind of collapsing, so let's say the work was over here, the representation yeah. was over here, then they sort of went like this. Yeah. And I guess m my question is, what if they keep going like that, <laughs> so that so that then the, the what constitutes the work, what constitutes the sort of the primary thing, has in fact become the space of representation, and does that make what does that do to the building world? I mean, could could you do this same presentation with quote actual buildings and make it as interesting? <laughs> no, I. Um... I think this is a kind of an underlying uh, primary discussion in architecture today. I mean, for, for some of the people who, uh, the, for some of the wizards, as you said before, of architecture world, I think architecture does not primarily have to do with building today. 
So I think that the museum is a possible stage for this performance where the building becomes the representation, the, the representation evaporates to some other condition. But at the same time, I, I, I would tend to resist to this. I think that my final, my final task is to put the architects in a condition that they can actually, the next step is to build something like that. I think so, I, I, my task is to, to, to change the world. I mean, to make the museum a tool to change the world. No, not to make the museum a tool to change the museum itself. Uh, so. But, it, but so we'll just let's stick with this one. Where would you draw, how, how, where do you draw the line between this as a representation and this as a built work? Like, why isn't that a built work? Well, not in this case, but if we go to, yes, in this case, this is a built work. No, but that just looks like a house. That just looks like a. Yeah, it is. This is a built. This is a house. No, but I'm saying, that's a more interesting house. Yeah, because I want to live there. Have no interest in living there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, but I, I don't think you need that line. I think that line is lost. If that's what we're going to. So the line between representation and work, is lost. Well, I experimented this physically in this energy show, because the energy show is designed that you have this long wall, the typical maxi wall, uh, of course, not orthogonal, where we have all these beautiful drawings of the Luigi Nervi highway restaurants of the 60s, so you have the representation. On the other side, you have the contemporary architects who all did physical space. Uh, it's a difficult dialogue. It's a difficult dialogue, but I think we have no way of going back. So we will keep, we will keep trying to build the space in the museum. But I think, well, my task is that this physical newness we, we build in the museum can expand outside the museum and become, uh, become the city itself. But this is, this is a line. I think it, there is no line. There is no line between, between the uh, Anish Kapoor building the subway stop in Napoli, no? It could be an installation in the museum, it's a subway stop in Napoli. So the experimental architecture we do in the museum has to become the, the, the space of the city, basically. Um, your, the videos that you chose and um, the, a sub-theme of the work that you showed um, uh, d had an had an emphasis on certain a, a, a constellation of things, so children, like actual quote actual children. I have to say, I always get a little crazy when I see children used in architectural photography that, that's, because that, that, they're children of a friend. They're very vulnerable. No, I love children. You know, I love puppies. I love children. Um, but, I, but I'm always made very suspicious when I see children used as um, evidence of no, innocent, I agree. I agree. Re, the real pleasure in architecture. But I would just say, so we had, um, and, and then there were slightly bigger children, the high schoolers that were building things, and then the young architects who were building things, and it was important because they were there. We saw long pans of their faces sweating from actually building things. Um, there, 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 is a, there is a logic about, um, uh, underneath that, there is a logic about the real world in I there that I'm, I'm curious to have you think about because, or have you, t you know, uh, part of what you're saying is that some, somehow the, the, the point of the museum is that it's not, quote, not a real space, and the point would be to push out and invade, quote, the real space, and I'm trying to figure out where you think or what the distinction between a not real and a okay. real is, because I think that maybe today that's more important than the distinction between the work and its representation. I no. I, I, um, I, I, we, we do this in Italy. Italy leaves, Italian architects still leave a condition of brutal, and I would say dramatic separation from the life 
uh, of their own country. I mean, this is the, there is a beautiful study, there is a research from the EU, which is dedicated to mapping the, how do you say, el gradimento, so how much people in the different countries love their own architects. And of course, the, the, you know, the dark was the dark when they don't like you. And I, Italy was, of course, the darkest. So uh, one of the tasks I have with the museum is to try to reconnect uh, the Italian architectural culture with, with, with the real, you would say. I would say with, with, it, with its context, with the people who has to dialogue with architects, who have a dialogue with architects. So, uh, the fact that I, this space outside, outside the museum and the museum itself is used also to reconnect this discussion, which is completely lost in Italy. Uh, second, uh, so this is, one of the, this is one of the problems for me I have to solve. So I have to use the museum to give the architectural culture of my country the possibility to survive, basically, which is, which is not sure. Uh, second is, I, I, I put that image, because I love that image, I don't care about the children, that's a friend, uh, an architect's, uh, arch the architect's children, uh, but, but it was interesting for me. Uh, when we built these uh, hills with the puppies, uh, every, every academic or typical architect hated it, because it was not about architecture according to them. Um, and I was very happy with them because they were uh, interesting, innovative. They were not, you could not say if it was architecture, landscape, art, or design, industrial design. And when we took, we took them away, the neighbors reacted. They didn't, want us to, they didn't want us to take away this piece of thing we have built in the museum because they, they felt like they needed it in their space. I think I, this, is the, this is not necessarily interesting in architectural terms, but it was very interesting for us because uh, it made clear that the museum or whatever institution producing this architecture has its sense of necessity in the space of the city. Uh, in this sense, I think it, in this sense, I think I've lost the separation between the exhibitional and the real. Uh, I think I. I think a museum has the possibility to create condition in which the real and the fictional get mixed and work together and work at the same time and become the same thing. So you said something right at the very beginning. You said um, you talked about the curating disease. Um, could could you, what is the disease? What did, what did you mean well, by that? The disease for me, we, we, we met in one of these, is this kind of uh, every, every, every week there are a, a dozen symposiums around the world about curating. Uh, every school is opening like three or four master programs on curating, which are generally taught by people who have never done exhibitions in their life. And so uh, the, what's behind this for me is this risk of in thinking that curating is a discipline, where curating for me is a practice. Uh, curating is not an academic discipline. Curating is a in, in the history of exhibitions, especially in Italy, exhibitions were made by, if we think of the beautiful 60s, uh, Triennale or Biennale exhibition, they were made by uh, historians, scholars, architects, journalists, uh, whoever would, there was not a curator figure. I am basically the first curator of architecture in the, in the history of Italy, no? So for, for me, uh, reacting to the curating disease, it's a way to emphasize that I am there because of the task I want to achieve, but not for the sake of curating itself. So you think it would be bad if curating became a discipline? I think so. I mean, it's becoming a discipline. It's becoming a discipline. So would, I, would there be a way to turn that around? I mean, would there be a way to say it's becoming a discipline? How does one make it a good discipline? Or what are the implications of it becoming a discipline? Yes, of course. I mean, yes, of I think course. it's too late to stop it from becoming a discipline. It's a discipline now. I think I think that the um, I think that the this. The, the, the difficulty of establishing an architectural discourse today makes it easier to speak about curating 
versus speaking, versus speaking about the contents of architecture. Uh, this is this is for, for some publications that we may think of. I think we, of course, we can make it a good discipline, but as long as we acknowledge that uh, that it's a practice. I mean, you learn about exhibitions by doing exhibitions. But couldn't you say that about anything? Mm. I mean, so you, you, mm. if you think back to the, if you think back to Hitchcock and Philip yeah. Johnson and and those periods, and you, and you just think about the history of the 20th century, lots of architects started as architects and then became something else. And many of them in the immediate generation above me, two generations above me, they became historians. Yeah. And they became historians of a certain kind. And now, sort of instead of historians, they're becoming curators. I mean, there's a, yeah. the history, history is often disseminated as a designed installation. So datascaping, mapping on walls, et cetera, is now one of the primary vehicles of the dissemination of historical ideas. And so you're talking about a kind of expanded field of production that is somewhere between history, between architectural practice. I mean, I could ask this another way. I could ask a a Andy, just to, like in relation to this show here, which people had a chance to look at. So, so um, there is a there is a kind of beginning thread that starts as a examination of a historical moment, and somewhere it mutates into something else, and then there's a piece of it in which the exemplification of the historical content turns into a very strong. I, I do not mean this in a pejorative way, but it's going to sound that way for a moment, um, just for a moment, because I have to get through to the other side of the argument, right? It turns into a very elaborate installation design, right? So exhibition history becomes exhibition design, becomes the installation that maybe, let's say, ate the history. Would, would you feel that that's a fair assessment? Uh, I was just finishing up my essay for that, uh, for the exhibition catalog, and I was referring to a lot of the work in it as uh, juvenilia and dead ends, and trying to figure out what one could possibly do with it left, and that it was sort of like a paleontologist looking at dinosaur bones and trying to read in them things that would later become paintings. And so I thought, What you would have made it into. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, that's always the problem of the architect design and, and both the folks involved in curating and in design. It is not a neutral, it, it is not, it, 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 unapologetically, it's not a dominant activity, it's not a um, hmm. objective activity. Which is, which is somehow to imply that for a historian it is an objective thing, which of course it, it's not. But, but, I'm, but I'm just saying no, that I there's have, a... I have to say that, something on yeah. this. Well... Well, no, we, we never... Object. I, uh, when I, if I... I mean, you, you were describing my life, no? Because I was an architect, I was a, I was a critic, I was a half historian, and then I became a curator. Uh, when I write a book, well, well, no, I don't write history books. But if I, when I, when you write an history books, you want your task is your book. When I, when I do an exhibition, my task is not the exhibition. My task is what I can produce through the exhibition. That's the difference for me. Okay. Uh, okay. No? I, I'm, I'm I know it's weak. I'm, I'm trying something out, okay? okay. And wh what I'm trying out, I'm just going to see if it flies, right, in the, in the spirit of experimentation. I'm trying out the following idea, that, that there, just as there were once, that just as there was once, I'm losing my capacity to 
conjugate verbs, uh, a distinction between the work and its representation. There used to be a distinction between different kinds of platforms, let's call them. We'll say history was one platform. Yeah, yeah, you need Architecture to was one platform. Mm -hmm. Criticism was another platform. Art installation design was another platform, a very important platform. And graphic design was yet another platform. And I'm trying out the idea that they are converging into one super discipline of which the curator is becoming the master conductor. And that that is uh, a change to be reckoned with and that everybody is converging on that point. And that, that and, and I'm trying to think through what are the implications of that convergence, right. particularly as I look at young people who are beginning to practice, uh, well, young people who are learning and people who are beginning to practice and people who are practicing and people who are becoming, quote, museum architects, and, and there is a kind of pot at the end of the, the what do you call it, at the end of the rainbow, which is supposed to be some other kind of realization. And part of what I'm thinking is maybe they're already there, right? At the space of the museum is the real space, and it is the space of this convergence. Maybe, maybe resisting the idea that it's a discipline is something that we should stop doing and start becoming expert. We should instead start becoming expert practitioners oh, no, my, of that my, discipline. My Catholic sense of guilt would, would take me to say no, but my practice tends to, to be exactly what you, I mean, what I would like to do, what people seems to be trying to do is, is exactly what you said. I don't know if this is good or bad, of if this makes, if this necessarily makes curating a discipline, no? Because the architect, architecture itself is hardly a discipline, no? Architecture itself is something between art, discipline, and practice. Uh, and probably this melting condition you described uh, can be a base for future de interesting developments. But I, I think, yes, it can fly. It can fly, but, but I think, uh, I don't know how to say this in English, but to, to make this possible, you need, I mean, to make the center of this body, so where the curator is, if the curator is the balance point between the, uh, the artist, the historian, the architect, the, the technician, the engineer, then you need also to have idea at, at the extremes. No? You need architecture to, to keep going, the tech techniques or technology to keep going. I mean, you, 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 you need the discourse to make the curator the center of the discourse, because uh, maybe the curator is not enough, that the, the space where everybody meets is not enough, uh, and you need specific developments in, the, in this kind of disciplines around it. Uh, probably, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm, I'm speaking. Before. I never thought about. No, this just. Think, I mean, the whole point of this reacting. is just yeah. to think out loud. So, and which is all I'm doing. So, I, I, two two things um, uh, come to mind. Um, one is, you know, I, I don't want to go all the way back to the question of what is a discipline versus what is a no, practice. That's a that's a big uh, can of worms, which I don't think we have to open. Except in this particular case, I, I will just say for. For me, in thinking about this, a discipline uh, demands self-awareness, and the word practice is often an excuse, not in this case, but no, it's no, often no. used as an excuse to not be self-aware, okay. right? I'm just, I'm just practicing. So, so let's say, let's, uh, for me, I, if, I'm, if I have to choose, which I do often between discipline and practice, I choose discipline. I just want to be clear about my, my position. I choose discipline over practice, and I think like practice is where the kids like to play in the water, and I believe in discipline, which is it, sort of intellected, just, just so that we're clear about that. Um, they, but, but another thing that one thinks of in relation to curating today is that and I think it's one of the challenges that it poses, is that we still don't 
quite fully think of the curator as he or she who produces work. I mean, I know this is where you're trying to go. But we do tend to think of the curator as he or she who engages with the work produced by others. So to me, that raises two questions. Hmm. It raises a question about the curator in part as a kind of a consumer, mm -hmm. right, as opposed to only as a producer, um, which I think is an important shift for today. And I think that that's a, a kind of uh, a, a challenge. And that, and that in turn, then, it raises a question about the autonomy of the object itself. The, hmm. the reason I have, so wh where is this in particular? But that's what's there right now? Partly. That's, that's where you're going. OK. So um, <laughs> no, no, no. You don't think I'm going to No. No. You don't know where I'm going. I'm going to a place much worse than you could possibly imagine. So I want to ask you, what is the role of the curator in this work? This is a work in a show that had a curator. And we're, ta we're trying to investigate the role of the curator. What I, is the role of the curator in this work? I told you I was going to go no, to I, a much I, uglier I, place than you I could imagine. The curator had a huge impact on the production of the work because he said that architecture in Los Angeles has some level of sculptural quality. And I think he made, with the choice of words and the choice of the work, a statement about how this work will be consumed, the Consum consumption level from the people coming to the show and the work in the show. He said um, there is a relationship between sculpture and architecture, and that is a relationship that we have with object of art and formalist work that is produced in Los Angeles. And I think, at least what, I've, what I understood, um, he made an assumption about how this is lived uh, in the space. So my answer to the big question of the show was, can I make a piece that starts engaging the public in that sculptural way? And can that be a middle scale between a pavilion and architecture? And that space um, responded to Christopher Mount's reading of architecture, which I think is, he is an art curator in, in many ways. I mean, the more I worked mm. on the show, the more I talked to him, the more I thought he chose work that had to do with ar ar artistic consumption much more than architectural consumption of architecture, of the field. So I think that part of the curatorial work is in this work. The rest, I mean, is what I also wanted to do with it, but. I don't know if that answers the question. So, so, you, so you think that the position of the curator was to make a space for the exploration of a certain? It was a reading of LA architecture as an art curator would. He selected work that was spatial in a sculptural way. He gave a label to the work saying that's sculptural work. He said that's what architects in Los Angeles do and he chose a lot of them. Um, and I think he gave, I think, a big imprint to, to what, at least to how this work is perceived. Now, we all know what happened afterwards. And that was rejected by the architects in the show, thinking actually there is a big difference between architecture and art and, and, and all we know from, from this discussion. Um, Why did you chuckle? Uh, no, because for, first I want to say one, one thing is, what I mean when I say that, I, that, that the, the discipline practice thing, for me, the only sense of this is that I could not believe, I don't think you can write a manual of curating, where you can definitely write or try or I, I'm, have the ambition to write a manual of architecture, of, of history, of whatever. You will not write. That, that's the only thing. For the rest, I think that practice and discipline get mixed in my work. Uh, Regarding to this, I think, I think Elena was implicitly putting his finger, her finger on a crucial point. I do believe there is a difference between 
my work and the work of an art curator. And I think that this difference ends up exactly where you were, what you were saying before in the autonomy of the object. Of the object. I maybe cynically think that the architecture curator uh, has the possibility to deal with a weaker autonomy of, of the object to create its, its own architectural discourse. I mean, when I, I see how the art curators work, they, they, they apart that they, they, first of all, they get very much, they, they couple with artists, which you don't have, you need to do with you're an architect curator. And then the object, every object wants to be individual. Every object wants to be on its own. In the architecture shows, you have the freedom to make the object react. The object or the representation, sometimes you can mix. Uh, the object and the representation, they, they can react one to, the, to each other, which is what makes the curator's work in architecture very similar to the historian or the, or the critic, as you said before. And I think this challenging, this act of challenging the autonomy of the ob object makes the work of an architecture curator interesting because you can, you know, you can test the flexibility and you can test the resilience of this materials by putting them together in a way or in another way. I am an architect. I was trained as an architect. When I think of an exhibition, I think of space. And I do not only think of a list of things. Um, I think of space. I think of how the things will sit in the space and will create a different condition in the space. What, what, what do you, how do you measure the success of an exhibition? <laughs> we were having a little well, they, bit of they, conversation. They, they, they fire me. When I, uh, well, I uh, I think that the the highest success there are two 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 way of scoring success in exhibit. One, if you choose the, the right uh, person. I mean, when I do an exhibition of uh, you know in, in the maxi, the photography is in the I have the collection of photography in the architecture museum because the art people don't want photography. So if I do an exhibition on Giri, I know every, every review will be good, everybody will love it, and it's easy. When I do more controversial thing, I, I, uh, an exhibition for me is successful when it, it works both ways, when it works both towards the center of the architecture world and towards the opposite, towards the total uh, mm, crashing down limits of architecture world. Recycle was perfect on this side because it was interesting both on a theoretical uh, aesthetic or whatever, you know, uh, disciplinary uh, discourse, but it was also very much open. Uh, it was a way in which people could get closer to architecture. So that, that's for me the perfect exhibition, which is different from no, look, we, we, were having, we were having a conversation in the car driving down here about metrics like foot traffic, right? And so if you work at a museum, one of the ways that you make a distinction between a good show and a bad show is the number of people who come. Um, another way to measure, come on, that's what you were saying. You were saying so-and-so. No, I, I, I know I have to bring, I need, at the I need to bring a lot of people, which is not the same. I need to bring a lot of people to exhibitions. Yes. Oh, okay, but but so uh, one one of the issues around this show, this particular show, had to do has to do with the economics of the exhibition. Yeah. And it has to do with a significant transformation in the culture of museums generally. That is, let's say, can be reduced to the determination of foot traffic. So you have an institution that is essentially coming apart at the seams because on the one hand, you have a, a director who is trying to increase foot traffic and you have artists on the board who object to the idea of using foot traffic as a measure. Mm -hmm. And this has produced a huge clash that is going to close the museum. Wow. Like it is, in the end, that museum is going to fail because of the inability to think through that problem. And the fact that in this exhibition, sort of what I'm trying to tell you guys, that the fact that in this exhibition, the pavilions 
whatever you say about their sculpturalism, and you're a very elegant defender of this, <laughs> Elena, you should, you should get an ambassador's prize somehow, um, the silver tongue of Elena. Um, the fact that everything is like a midget, Right, mm -hmm. I mean, it's like a big thing, you know, it's a little project that then became a big thing, and now shrunk down to like a midget size. Um, uh, this, and, and yet we're still full of this discourse about the, the you know, whatever. Uh, but that, it, it, in the end, it's about, not about this particular show, but about how you evaluate um, what constitutes a good show, what its audience should be, how you're gonna measure it, at, uh, at literally how you're gonna measure it. So this is why I was asking, I'm trying to think back, can you, th what do you think of as the most important architectural exhibitions of the last, say, 50 years and why? What, what do you think that they would have been? Well, it's easy, yeah. <laughs> I think the most effective um, architectural exhibition of the last 50 years was the Biennale in 1980, for instance, because it was on one side, even if we don't like, no, Portuguese, we hate Portuguese, but at the same time... The, 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 the 1980 Venice Biennale yes, was the first proper ar showing of architecture at the Biennale. There was one a little bit before that, and it's the one that we, at least in the United States, associate with the sort of birth of postmodernism post in, the, in the Michael Graves sense. And its key was the spine of this thing that was called the very new street with all of the facades by however many thousands of architects, and the one in which people showed at the beginning Aldo Rossi's theater, the, the theater floating around. So, so that's what he's talking about. So that was an exhibition which was very, which was sensing very clearly, which was the architectural culture of the time, the architectural moment. But at the same time, it was incredibly accessible uh, to people who went to the Biennale. So, and, and of course, it was much more complicated than than the birth of, because between the, the actors building their facades in the Corderia, there was Frank Gehry, there was Ram Koulis, there was a lot of people that was not exactly uh, frameable, no? In the postmodernist, uh, in the postmodernist, uh, let's say, style or whatever stereotype. So, so that, that for me is an incredibly successful experience. And of course, that was one, I think was the first time in Italy when uh, we're in an architecture show, you actually built a one-to-one -one piece of architecture, no? So, if I have to acknowledge my roots, <laughs> no, we, we got one. Well, you built a, yeah, you built a one-to-one, -one, except it was totally flat and it was a yeah. picture, so, um, okay. Um, so, to, let's, just to wrap up a little bit, down to brass tacks. So, you are a member of the jury of the Young Architects Program. Uh, what do you want to see? How do you pick who you pick? What, what is your, what do they need to do to be the architects of the next Young Architects Pavilion? And then I would ask you even more, once you have built the pavilion, what do you need to do to move your practice from the pavilion into, uh, quote, the real world? Mm -hmm. I think, I think if you could give them those keys, they would have spent a good hour here. Well, the, we saw some of the winning schemes around here, no? Uh, I think this is terrible, by the way. <laughs> I choose it, but, it, but sometimes you, 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 you know, it's, it's a relative success, no? You have five, well, five projects, you have to, be, to choose one that it works, that it can be built because sometimes it can't be built, no, it doesn't work. And uh, but anyway, I think a good, I think that, that the, this was a very good example. Uh, what, what, I, what I'm expecting from the young team who participates to the, to the, um, to the YAP program is to be active on the two sides I already quoted. I think it has to be, uh, Experimental, extremely experimental, but at the same time, it has to be extremely uh, good in answering what what the demands of these things are, which is to create uh, 
an accessible and pleasant space with, with shadow water and shadow water and seeds. Um, given that, every, every possibility is open. Um, this year we're building a suspended building on the air, in the air. Uh, of course, it's, it's very different because in, 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 the, in the MoMA you do not challenge, in the PS1 you do not challenge the architecture of the PS1. It's a precinct, you build something in the precinct. In the Maxi you have Zaha Hadid uh, heavily influenced, so, so you need to be more architectural or more anti-architectural it was in this case. But I think that this idea of being able to conjugate the highest architectural intensity with this, I, with this sense of death that architecture also, no? the disappearance of architecture, which is there every day today. To be so ambiguous, but at the same time effective, I think it's a, it's a way. Uh, but I think this has to come somehow unconsciously in the end. Uh, what was interesting in this case, that these kids had the possibility to made this piece uh, like an industrial design. So they were ready, to go back to what Sylvia was saying before, they were ready to work at all scales, in, in all conditions. So to design an object, to react to a competition on a public space, uh, to think in specific architectural terms. So I think that the YAP project is a good, uh, is a good stage, is a good, uh, practice field to, to test this flexibility. So you have to think of some, something which is buildable, which is easily buildable. You have to negotiate with somebody who will give you money to do it, to, to do it even nicer. You have, to be, you have to work on a small scale, but then you have to learn devices that will be interesting also at a bigger scale. I, I, but I, in the end, but if you really ask me, the most important thing is that you have ideas. I mean, for me, architecture is ideas. So if you have ideas, then you can learn the technicals and the tools and the languages you need to express. So architecture has to have ideas on the word. If you have ideas on the word, you'll find a way to turn them into a space. And then also, I think there is very, there is, there are specific differences. I mean, to be a young architect, in Santiago del Chile, today is different to be a young architect in Rome or in Istanbul. I think in, 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 in Santiago, as, as in largely in South America, there is a still uh, an idea of the architect is an architect. The architect is somebody who's get a commission to build a house and he builds the house. In, in, in Rome, if you sit at your desk and wait for a phone call that tells you, hey, do you want to do my house? This will never happen. The architect has become a social agent, an activist, which creates his own work. Uh, America, I think, is in, at, this, at this age, at least, is in between. So you need to also use uh, an experiment like this, an experimentation like this, to understand what is to be an architect in the context you are in. Because I think this, this profile of the architectural professional is, is changing, is changing in time and, and space. So I think the YAP is, is nice because it's a confrontational, it's, it's an area where these changes can also be monitored, can also be monitored, not can be expressed. Do, <coughs> do you, is the YAP gonna continue to expand? So it started in New York and then Chile, now there's more and more. Are there gonna be more? Is it gonna be, what, what do you think of the future? I think the, I think the MoMA, which is the, the agent behind the, the action, is, is, is very willing to find a venue in, in, in East, in the East world, like Korea or China. I think, it, some, I think they, it will be difficult to add venues in the areas where there is already one, but it will be interesting to expand it. For Istanbul, it's quite a, an interesting new condition, so I think it was a very good idea to, to expand it. it. It will expand in areas where there is not, I think. Um, well, not easy but to convince more, by the way. No, 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 but I mean, it's a, um, I guess, uh, I was just trying to say that if you think about, if we return to the beginning and think of the museum as a kind of operating platform as its own form of discipline and practice, then you see it 
not mimicking, but confronting the same kinds of conditions, let's say, of globalization, of dispersion, and, and so forth, that everybody's facing in every particular uh, venue. Um, I guess maybe just to, to uh, wrap up, um, to, to conclude, maybe, um, you know, I, I think that every time you show your work in a review, you're curating a little exhibition. Um, and so you, you, you as students are all already curators. And I think that there are some, um, in, you know, there, there are, uh, I would strongly protest uh, against the idea that curating isn't a discipline. I, I actually think it's a discipline that gets better with discipline, the more you know how to do it. And there are some super, you know, I mean, I think people has been very, very clear about some of the issues that come up with curating. Uh, let, let's say you talk about architectural curation as something slightly different than an architectural practice per se. It, it does put certain issues on the table very clearly. One of them is what is the dialogue that is being produced between this object and other objects? That, that is one of the things that a curator does, is put things into relation one with another. So when that's a slightly different way of thinking about how you're going to present your work, which tends to always uh, think not in terms of relation, but in terms of the autonomy of objects all repeating the same issue. Uh, at, at some other moment, you and I will have a long conversation about the piece, the part of your uh, installation that moves away from the object and up the wall, um, because this is the key moment in which Elena is working out where her thing stops and where the rest of the world uh, uh, ends. And that is an, a, an incredibly urgent moment of uh, curatorial framing, let's say. And I would really argue against the idea that that has an architectural logic in a classical sense of tectonic and space and sculpture, think that's bullshit, and instead think that it is you acting as the curator of your own. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that we're taught, but this is exactly the challenge that curating raises. What is the degree to which you're obligated, essentially, to play with others when you're making work today? That's a really, you know, and this is one of the issues, I think, that you were talking about in relation to your own work. So anyway, this curating disease, I mean, I think it's a little bit like the common cold. We all have it a little bit. And you are, and you already have it, so you might as well figure out what the vitamin C is that's going to work the best for you. I think personally, I think that that's um, that's really important. The 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 second thing I would say, and that I would say is like as an estate, as a statement, as an assertion. The 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 last thing I'm going to say is maybe more um, of a kind of request. Um, because I do think that the space of the museum and the, the, these, these questions, the, the reason that they're important is because they become opportunities to redefine the world of architectural ideas and how they're going to operate. That's, that's, that's really, their, their, they don't particularly have intrinsic um, interest to me, but they, but they do raise those kinds of questions. And I think that the, the world of museum exhibition is at a funny, um, uh, precipice right now in which it's going to increasingly be confronted with a choice. And the choice is whether to become more and more like practice as we once knew it, which is to say to have some ideas rationalized by money to turn into popular foot traffic and yeah. public space, etc or whether it is going to push architecture to become something that we don't yet know. And, and I would ask as a plea, um, when you're taking that moment to curate, that you make sure that you are not using the space of the museum to simply replicate 
old forms of architectural practice in new territories. And that, I think, is really the danger. I think that when you say this Wendy is problematic, it's problematic because even though its form is new, its model of practice is really reactionary and retardataire. That, and that's what frightens me about these things, right? So that they become more and more uh, opportunities to reinforce old models in new forms. Rather, and it, it's just, we're right at the edge. And I think yeah. these, I mean, I'll just end. I think that the edge of your piece is exactly that edge. That's the edge that it's trying to think through. And I mean, I think that there are a lot of people that are trying to think through this problem super intelligently. I mean, it's just, it's just interesting to think that, you know, in your show here, the whole thing is this edge, you know, this edge that is trying to decide if it's a double-edged sword or, you know, what kind of edge this is. This is that edge between one understanding of architecture and, um, and another. Um, and I think that that's the edge of the curator as a function, not as a profession. Maybe, that, maybe that's another distinction. Anyway. You can have the last word. No, I, I just wanted to. Uh, one thing is that when I when I started the museum, I immediately told my director that I wanted to do uh, a a program, a project in which some young uh, some young team would build something in the outdoor space. Then the mama came, and then it was. But I would have done it anyway. Uh, mama was useful for you know communicational and marketing issues. But I would have done it anyway. Uh, second, I the reason why I do exhibitions. I'm I'm not a I'm not a I was not trained in a, as a curator. I was not trained in a, as an art historian. I do exhibitions because I am looking for new ideas in architecture. No, well, this is the main reason. Even when I do, I want to do. I would love now. Maybe we'll able to do. We'll be able to do a show on this incredibly interesting work by Italian architects uh, in the 60s. And there are a lot of them who nobody knows, because as Silvia was implicitly saying before, especially in Europe, we have lived in a kind of uh, hostile, host, uh, no? like a Cold War situation in, in architectural theory, in which architects were uh, chosen by Manfredo da Furi became not the masters and the other ones got forgotten. So there is a lot of architects in the 50s and 60s in Italy that are incredibly interesting that they can be uh, investigated. But if I do it now, it's because I want to say something about architecture today, of course, as, as Silvia did with, with, with her show, I think. Uh, so I, I, do, I do exhibitions because I want to find something new. And for me, it's very important to do exhibitions and to do experiments with very young architects or people you know, just coming out of from the school. Because I think we are at a turning point. Because I think that an architectural paradigm, I mean, most of the experimentation we are doing, still doing now, even in CyERG, are the outcome of a series of ideas, experiments, statements that were done in the 80s and in the 90s. Uh, the conditions of the world changed. Uh, I think architecture is looking for new paradigms in this moment, and I love to investigate this need for new paradigms in the younger generations because I think they are they are uh, ready to be sensible to life. Uh, third, I do not believe to the autonomy of architecture. I do not believe to the autonomy given. Even though I was trained in Venice in my PhD, I do not believe to the autonomy of architecture. So when I do, when I do a show on recycling or when I do a show on energy, in reality, I'm doing shows on architecture. I'm, 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 I'm uh, challenging the architects to look for the fuel for their ideas outside the world of architecture. Because I think architecture needs to be uh, hungry. Uh, in, uh, towards reality to grow ideas. So that's, that's why I look for topics that are apparently you know, far from the core of the architectural uh, language or whatever lexicon. Uh, last but not least, 
Uh, I think curating is a sum of discipline. Is an, is, no, it's a, it's a layered, uh, it's, a pra it's a practice, sorry, <laughs> which is made of, of many disciplines. No? So it's very hard to, to encode. I, I believe it's a discipline, but it's a very discipline, it's a discipline which is very hard to encode. No? Because we used to encode the disciplines. So it is a discipline in the sense that it is the result that you have to be aware of many disciplines to, to manipulate it. And also, I think it's very interesting to be a curator in the architecture world uh, if you have sensibility to space. If you, if you think of exhibitions also as a space experience, a spatial experience. So I, I don't think we're very, we're very far, but I do think that uh, exhibitions for me are not my task. Exhibitions for me are the means to get closer to where I want to get. So this, this doesn't do anything. Um, m uh, yeah. Well. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm just thinking. No, but you said questions. I mean, I don't know whether we uh, ask questions because I was just thinking about something for a second. Um, I mean, uh, um, most of you will have as your first projects. Like not a garage edition. That used to be the point of departure, particularly here in LA. Now your first thing will be something in a museum. <laughs> and I mean, I just think that that's the way it works now. That's the way it works. That's the, that's the reality of the unfolding of the field. And I, and I think that you have to think about that. I think you have to be smart about that. You have to try to understand what, what that means. Part of what it does not mean is to excuse you, if, you th if that's the right word, from thinking about the, the kinds of service pressures that the architect is generally under. You will go into a museum and you will complain that the budget is not big enough. You will complain that the site is not big enough. You will complain, you know, whatever. That it, that, that all, all I'm trying to say is that the problems of the garage are reappearing in the space of the museum. And that's kind of a drag. I mean, I think it's kind of a drag. So I think it's important, to, but at least I can say, anticipate that, and try to think through um, what that would mean. And the space of the museum, the issue is not whether architecture is autonomous any more than anything no. else is, yeah. but whether there is a space of culture that is autonomous, because now the space of the museum is as determined by money and pop, you know, it's this, I'm not sure that there really is a distinction between the space of the museum and, and anything space else outside, anymore. Yeah. That's really kind of the it. issue. And, and that's why on some level, it's super exciting because it is a, you know, I, I, on some level, more interesting things can happen there because of that. Anyway, listen, we've taken too much of your time. I don't know if there's anything urgent. I, 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 I was assuming you guys were gonna like have portfolios and what do I need to show and how do I win the next young <laughs> architects thing and what are the issues for next year? Can I start thinking about them already? Are they all gonna be, do we have to become eco-friendly? Yes. Like it's, yes. Uh, well, I, what, <laughs> I, I, um, in, in every brief, no, in, in every of the four briefs, you find a lot of this uh, recycling, sustainable, sustainable, social. But I think that's that's whatever. That's material the architects have to elaborate. It could just like any anything else. No, we we all are. Egg. The, the, the reasons why we did recycle and energy in the max is because I hate this sustainable approach and I wanted to see if it could be turned upside down to do something else. Uh, but I think, but I want to say something very conservative now. The, I, live in a, I live in a world where there's no, there's the, the amount of architectural quality 
you see around in, in the streets, whatever, the places where I live, is really, really little. So if we want to consider, instead of the architectural schools or the architecture magazines, whatever the office of Aldo Rossi or Frank Gehry, if we want to think that the museum is now the, the, the source where quality or ideas should spring, then we still have to have very clear in mind that they have to spring. I mean, they have to somehow find, find a way to spread uh, the space of culture, as, as Sylvia was defining it now, outside the limits of the museum. Because otherwise, I mean, my final task as an architect, I mean, if I, if I get another of my jackets, is to make the space I live and people around me live a little better, no? possibly better, not only investigate the meaning. I want to make the space better. And what I do in the museum has to be a source, uh, among many other things, many other uh, issues that I manipulate and, and aim to. Uh, we have to demolish in, in the 70s or in the, in the, in the 60s, the, the, the walls of the museums were often demolished from outside no, to inside. The people broke into the opening day of the De Carlo exhibition in 1968 before the opening, before the exhibition was open, the artist occupies this, occupied the space and, and crashed the exhibition down. So the society was invading the space of the museum. The society is not so active today. We are in the condition in which the museum is invading the space, or should invade the space. So what I do into the museum, in the, in, inside the museum, has to be something which has the energy or the power to break the wall, of, of to over, uh, go through the wall of the museum and somehow have some outcome in, in the space of society, in the space of the world. I think this is Finally, my prophetic. <laughs> so, okay, so we'll, we'll end there. Yeah, ex ex well, no, 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 I really want to end. We're going to end. Uh, did the pavilions go from outside to inside? I keep asking you. Like, at the. They're all inside. But they weren't originally supposed to all be inside, were they? Yeah. Pardon me? But when they, sh but I thought they moved inside when they shrank. No, no, no. They sold the <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah, but this is an artist who is designing the world, yeah. right? I mean, they are, they are uh, okay. No, 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 but so, but I, I had a really great narrative to end the conversation, which was that, which is just wrong. I made it up, but they have this great phrase in Italian, if it's not true, make it up anyway. Yeah. So that's what I was doing, which was that you were, that these things had, were supposed to be robust and big and outside and have been moved to the inside. That would make a good story. So let's just pretend that that's in fact um, that's in fact uh, the case, and it would be worth thinking about, you know, whether what happens to them if they become plop art, if they go. I don't know whether you want to be inside or outside. I think that that's a uh, that's a really interesting question about where it is. You know, do you want to be under the protection of the museum? I mean, it doesn't really sound like the museum protected you all that well, so maybe being outside is better. I, I don't know. Anyway, these, these are, uh, on some level, they're really not minor questions. They're really questions about the space of architecture in the world and what its value is and where it's allowed to operate. And I suppose, then, I, sh I, feel, I would feel remiss if I didn't end by saying that you're all supposed to show up, I'm sure you know better than I do, um, on Sunday at 12 o'clock on Alameda and Temple to see the show popping out of a U-Haul truck somehow in retaliation. I don't quite understand what the, its relationship there is, but there is a kind of, it's, it's not a salon de refusé, because they were never refused, but a, 
a salon of me too there could be um, that I wish people was here to see but anyway maybe that would be a, a place to continue the conversation so thank you all for coming people thank you for coming you all this way you.